And then if you remember about two weeks ago, we had this big news thing that happened that microbial life might be in the skies of Venus. They found phosphine on it. And phosphine is definitely a sign of alien life. Of yeah, last week, uh, we had, uh, there is a professional astronomer who, uh, who joins us. And uh, he did actually say that this is not necessarily true. And I ended up doing a lot of research on it. And I found, uh, well, actually, there was one more news uh, newscast. And that was from our good friends at CNN that, that said that life has been detected. I mean, there was no, no doubt about it. Uh, because of the phosphine that was discovered in the Venusian atmosphere. However, uh, what would it be, uh, 40 some odd years ago, they discovered phosphine both on Jupiter and on Saturn's atmosphere. So this idea of if you discover phosphine, you've discovered life, uh, definitely does not hold water. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting statement. And uh, I wonder if uh, somebody saw something and decided to hype it up uh, to beyond their credibility at this point. So uh, just because they discovered phosphine doesn't mean that there's anything living up there. You heard it here first. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I think we're ready at this point to go ahead and uh, take a look at the two planets that we are possibly most uh, familiar with, and that's going to be the Earth. Some of us are uh, well acquainted with the Earth. Uh, some of us are, are not, uh, but we'll try to bring everyone up to speed on that. And then, of course, there's Mars. And according to some people, the human race may have started on Mars before they migrated to Earth. And the reasoning behind that is due to the fact that the circadian rhythm of our bodies is more attuned to a Martian day than it is to an earthly day. Oh, well, anyway, let's go ahead and get started. So this ancient star is about to under, undergo its final blast. The silicon shell uh, has started to, uh, because of the tremendous heat involved, started to fuse into iron. Iron does not fuse into anything else. In fact, uh, with the iron core, it actually saps the energy of the supergiant. Uh, and on its, literally on its last day, uh, this iron core will suck in energy, causing the core to collapse. When the core collapses, the shock wave that goes through the star will increase the heat you know, geometrically to the point where all of the matter will fuse into heavier elements. This is where our gold comes from, uranium, uh, uh, silver, lead, 
all, you know, antimony, all these heavier elements that are heavier than iron will come from the blast of the star going through its final dying phase. So what will happen? The iron core will form. It'll pull the energy out of the star. The core will collapse and the star will explode. This widening gas cloud is full of heavier elements. Uh, besides the elements that formed within the star are elements like gold, silver, uh, virtually anything that's above element number 26, which is iron. And this cloud will then <clears throat> begin to coalesce into a, a, uh, into a star and surrounding that star will be a, a cloud of gases and rocks, which will eventually coalesce into the planets. And this is where all of our <clears throat> all of our planets come from, all of our asteroids. And as it happens, uh, the star, a yellow star, a young yellow star, has a habitable zone that is actually encompasses uh, the second planet and just a little bit of the third planet. So the Earth is not quite inside the habitable zone of this particular star. But as time goes on, the star will increase its output. And as it does that, the habitable zone will move outward, uh, leaving the second planet in the cold, actually in the hot, and centering our Earth and actually reaching out to the fourth planet, Mars. So we've talked about the habitable zone before and what it represents. The habitable zone is the place where uh, temperatures are such that it'll support liquid water. And the big question is, why is water so important? I mean, we have the obvious answers, but there are some parts of water that are vitally important. Uh, the fact that it, it shows cohesion and adhesion, uh, specific heats, density, but it is a solvent. It's a life solvent. Chemicals will dissolve in that and it's given the chance to dissolve or form into other chemicals, uh, chemicals that will promote life. When the, uh, when the solar system formed, the heavier, denser particles uh, migrated toward the center of our solar system, pulled in by the gravity of the sun. And as you moved outward, uh, we have particles that are not quite as dense, more gases, uh, ices, silicates, uh, iron, some iron compounds. So we have the uh, lighter elements moving far away. As a result, we'll have the gaseous and ice planets fairly distant. And then we have the dense planets in toward the center of our solar system. <clears throat> Mercury is the densest planet. And Earth is up there too. You can actually, if you compare the densities of Earth and Mars, you will see that Mars is considerably less dense than the Earth. So where did the water come from that permeates our solar system? Well, in looking at stars forming, they found that when the stars formed, there are actually uh, uh, molecules of water and hydrogen uh, products that are formed within that star. And given time, they will actually coalesce into water. Now, this particular graph shows two kinds of water, para water 
and ortho water. The difference between the two is actually the spin of the electrons. Uh, actually, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, Perrier uh, serves uh, ortho water and charges like it was uranium or something, but uh, uh, certainly the both waters work the same. But with the formation of our sun and the formation of our solar system, a lot of the hydrogen that formed within the solar system ended up in rocks and chondrites, which is a part, which is a uh, a, a meteor uh, type or asteroid type, and these types of chondrites have a great deal of hydrogen and the hydrogen products in them. And at the time that the Earth was formed, it was constantly bombarded, literally for billions of years, for a couple of billion years, where these rocks would hit the Earth and leave off the hydrogen that would uh, uh, combine with elements and form water. And as it did, the iron core would grow within the star, within our planet, and the surface would be covered with the hydrogen products. So as a result of this, this is where we get our water from. Uh, it was believed for a long time, and probably true to some extent, that a lot of the water came from comets. Uh, but uh, more recently, they're talking about uh, the fact that it may have come from asteroids. Surrounding the Earth is another ocean of sorts, and that's our ocean of air. And our ocean of air is approximately well, most of it's about 100 miles thick. Although there is a thin veil of atmosphere that actually extends as far as the moon. But this is extremely nebulous and very, very hard to find. So as a result, we have our atmosphere, which extends into space. It's held to the Earth by gravity. Now, when our Earth was formed, uh, the uh, oceans were extremely hot because of the lava. We were getting pelted by meteors, by uh, meteorites, uh, asteroids. Uh, it was uh, almost a constant rain as the water, the rain would come down, boil away, uh, ascend to the atmosphere of clouds, whereupon it would just simply rain again. And after several hundred million years of this, the surface of the Earth finally cooled to the point where we can get liquid water. Now, the, the Earth has had three main atmospheres since it was formed. The first atmosphere, uh, appeared shortly after it was formed, which consisted of mainly helium and hydrogen and other gases. Given time, these gases would actually combine and form more of an atmosphere uh, that, would, that would also have carbon dioxide, uh, ammonia, it would have water, and uh, this is the atmosphere that contributed to the formation of life on the Earth. And as a result of that, because life came on, was, was formed on the Earth, but life itself was actually responsible for giving us the third atmosphere, which now contains water vapor, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and most important, oxygen. So if you looked at the history of our, uh, of our atmosphere, you can see that 4.6 billion years ago, 
we had mainly uh, hydrogen, helium, maybe a little uh, ammonia, and water vapor. As it cooled, our carbon dioxide came into the play. And was, as you can see, nitrogen started filling in the, basically the rest of our atmosphere. Oxygen didn't appear until about two, maybe two and a half billion years ago. So oxygen is kind of a late uh, bloomer in this. But the appearance of oxygen was kind of sudden, and it resulted in a mass uh, 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 killing of almost all the microbial life on the Earth because oxygen is actually a toxic gas. And many life forms, especially plant life forms, cannot sustain themselves on it. Meanwhile, inside the Earth, we have a spinning core. And as this core spins, it actually uh, distributes the heat that was generated from the formation of our planet. This, the formation of our planet uh, actually cools when it uh, actually cools when you go toward the surface and then uh, heats up as it flows down toward the center. This, this action where the lava actually flows uh, will actually cause the continents to move. And this, this is now called plate tectonics. So as you're watching the Earth move and the core moves, it generates a, a basically heat and a magnetic field. But it also uh, causes the continents to drift. Uh, to the point where what we have now was nothing like what we had simply 200 million years ago. So here's the Earth the way it is today, and we are still undergoing changes on the Earth because of plate tectonics. But that's actually a good thing, because it's because of the plate tectonics that we have a magnetic field. And this magnetic field protects us against the high energy particles coming from the sun. These high energy particles will cause the aurora, uh, both on the north and south poles. And it'll actually dissipate that energy uh, through these auroras. And as a result, of dissipating that energy, it never makes it to the surface of the Earth. And this radiation is extremely uh, uh, toxic to any life that would have formed on the Earth. High energy radiation will damage DNA and will cause mutations. Whether these mutations are good or bad, uh, time is needed to figure that out. So on the Earth, at various uh, puddles, shall we say, there was the formation of life. These, the the uh, water acted as a solvent, which caused chemical reactions. Uh, bacteria would uh, give up their DNA and would try to mutate into other types of life forms. Unfortunately, the, uh, the uh, radiation from the sun would destroy this, uh, these life forms, and then it would keep on trying. It went through billions and billions of, of trial and error before, a, before uh, DNA was finally uh, became stable enough 
to uh, form a life form. And here we have the evolution of these life forms into various uh, single cell and multi cell animals, plants, eventually, given about four and a half billion years, it became us. Now, what helped a great deal about this was actually our sun. And our sun, come on, we have a sun coming up. There it is. And our sun, uh, people said, well, our sun is perfect. It's the right size. It's the right radiation sauce, source. It's nice and stable. I mean, it, we're lucky to have it. Actually, the sun was here first. And we evolved to use the sun, energy from the sun. So anything that says that you know, we're lucky to have the sun, no, the sun is lucky uh, in the fact that it was, you know, that with the radiation and the energy that it's giving off, we evolved to use it. Our sun is basically a medium star. It's a uh, sometimes called a white, a, um, actually it's a yellow white giant star and gives off energy in a part of the spectrum that looks like this. So here is the natural sunlight spectrum. And as you can see, it's right in the area that we, that we could see. Actually, we could see because we evolved to be able to see this radiation. And this is the, uh, the spectrum, the, what they call the visual spectrum of a person. So as you can see, we're leaning a little bit toward the uh, 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 green-blue. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, that's the, the best frequencies that we can see. If we look at photosynthesis, where the plants use the energy from the sun, their uh, spectrum looks like this. As you can see, they are pretty heavy in the uh, far red and far blue spectrum. And if you go further, into the blue spectrum. We have what's known as uh, type C ultraviolet. And this is the part that gives you sunburn. Luckily, we have a little bit of a block for that. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Anyway, but because our sun was giving off a great deal of light, and there was lots of bacteria on the Earth. Eventually, this bacteria started to react to sunlight. These are called chloroplasts, and chloroplasts are actually a bacteria. And chloroplasts uh, actually combined with a kind of a slime uh, to form a, uh, another type of animal. So when the chloroplasts joined with kind of like a, a, a plasma, a, 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 a slime sort of uh, uh, animal, I guess you can call it, uh, something strange happened. So the chloroplast bacteria combined with the slime and it formed a plant that was able to use sunlight. It actually used sunlight to help manufacture its food. And the waste product was oxygen. This is called endosymbiosis, where one bacteria engulfs the other one, and they live now together 
and both bacteria benefit from the arrangement. And as a result of this, this new arrangement will actually get passed down from generation to generation. So now we have a type of plant that's able to use sunlight to help manufacture its food. And that's a form of cyanobacterium, and it's one of, one of the simplest forms of life. So we have a cell membrane, we have cytoplasm in there, uh, in the DNA, and then surrounding the cell are, it says photosynthetic membranes, actually those are chloroplasts. And this plant will now use the nutrients in the water that was sol that was uh, as a solvent to a lot of the materials uh, on the uh, bottom of the oceans, and then use the energy from the sun to manufacture its food, and a byproduct, a waste product of this reaction is oxygen. So we have the cyanobacterium uh, just covering the earth. And it took, didn't take that long for this uh, life form to be able to replace the toxic atmosphere with something, well, to some plants, that was even more toxic. And of course, that toxic atmosphere was oxygen. So as you can see, the Earth now has a great deal of oxygen. About 21% uh, of our atmosphere is oxygen. And now the plants that were dying because of the atmosphere had to do something to be able to live in this new atmosphere. And what they did, they took another bacteria and they modified it so that when this new bacteria called mitochondria was absorbed by uh, some other uh, plant, it was able to use the oxygen and be able to make the food that it needed to live. So we have one plant that actually ate the uh, toxic atmosphere and gave us oxygen. And then we have another plant that was able to use the oxygen. And all of these uh, uh, mutated bacteria uh, as a result of endosymbiosis is now in our cells. So if you look at a plant cell or an animal cell, you will find, at least in a plant cell, chloroplasts, and in both plant and animal cells, you will find mitochondria. So that's a pretty neat thing to be able to take a bacteria and make something useful out of it. So in the more recent past, you can see that our, our global temperatures were somewhat level. Our atmospheric CO2 uh, was kind of up and down. Uh, and they're going down to very small levels more recently, uh, at least in the last two, three or 400 years. However, the oxygen levels have been rather weird. Uh, I think what's also weird is the fact that we have a dinosaur wearing sneakers, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, but if you look at the oxygen levels, about 60 million years ago, oxygen levels were around 33%. Our level today is 21%. So we had more oxygen in the air 60 million years ago. Well, what happened? 
Well, lots of stuff happened since then. But at that time, at the time that our oxygen levels were so high, uh, one of the things that happens is the fact that insects, because they breathe through their skins or through their shells, are actually immersed in oxygen. And as a result, they get very they got very large. Can you imagine finding that on your wall? The other thing is, can a wall actually support it? Bet you it would take several National Geographics to get that one gone. Anyway, um, so uh, these giant insects were around when oxygen levels were at their highest. A good thing that happened with this was the fact, oh, there's fleas. Can you imagine, there's a flea. I mean, right now fleas are almost microscopic, yet there's a flea on a dinosaur. That must have been miserable. Yeah, he was a, that would be about a, a two inch flea about that big. But that would be, I mean, they're scary anyway, but have one that big? Oof. Anyway, because of the oxygen in the air, it started reacting with the sun to form ozone. And this, this ozone is actually protecting the surface of the earth from high level ultraviolet light, the part of light that gives you bad sunburn. And uh, without it, uh, I don't think human life uh, would be possible. So we are thankful for the ozone layer, which formed after our earth was basically covered with oxygen. And because the ozone layer protected so much life on the earth, even life that's very, very fragile, we have had millions of species that cover the earth. Okay, so we've done the earth. Next one is Mars. And Mars is an interesting thing for, it's, uh, it's tilt is about the same as the Earth. The gra gravity is a little bit less than 40% of the Earth. Sunlight is less than 45% of the Earth. Uh, it has about one, oh, about one hundredth the density of the atmosphere than the Earth. So it's really not a very nice place to live. But we'll take a closer look on that because there's lots of interesting things. Pictures of, of uh, Mars uh, show a fairly rough surface. And, uh, but up until, well, actually about 40 years ago, 50 years ago, uh, people believed, let me get rid of that, there we go. People believed that there was intelligent life on Mars. Uh, in the 1800s, a uh, astronomer by the name of Schiaparelli uh, looked at Mars and thought he saw channels on Mars. Now, this was actually misinterpreted as canals. And of course, canals are built by people or Martians. And uh, so uh, the next astronomer who looked at this was Percival Lowell. And he had uh, all sorts of interesting things uh, Let's go ahead and do that. And uh, again, he uh, was looking at uh, channels, but got translated into canals. And then it was Percival Lowell who decided to 
basically interpret what he saw, where two canals met. He called that an oasis. Uh, it was fairly obvious to him that they were building water supplies uh, to uh, gather moisture from the poles to bring down to the various dry areas that was now uh, becoming more and more desert as the planet uh, aged. Uh, they even spotted uh, the building of two canals, uh, two huge canals, which definitely said that there was intelligent life on the planet. And this is the way things basically lasted. There was always a, a question if there was any kind of intelligent life on the planet. And that was more or less answered in the early 1960s when Mariner 4 got to Mars and took some pictures. This happened on July 15th, 1964, just two days before my interview with the first astronomy job I ever had. And then I saw this and I almost cried because that showed that with no atmosphere, it was being hit by meteors. And I went to my interview just, just devastated that Mars was a dead planet. Uh, anyway, so there's the picture, the first picture of, uh, from Mariner 4. And the second one showed craters, some of which were very, very old and uh, indicated that Mars did not have anything that would resemble a, shall we say, a livable uh, surface. Since that time, there have been, at least toward Mars, there have been 56 launches. There have been 26 successes. So the, uh, the success rate is about 50%. And there's four probes on the way. The, uh, there have been a rash of orbiters around the planet uh, that have actually spotted ma uh, the first uh, mariners and Mars that landed on the planet. Mars 2, this is a picture of the Russian Mars 2 lander, and that supposedly is a picture of the surface of Mars. I'm having trouble seeing anything on that one. But the orbiters did actually find that particular probe and were able to zero in on it. And in fact, the, the uh, orbiting probes uh, have spotted uh, tr you know, a tremendous amount of detail and proof that there is actually liquid water on the planet and that the planet uh, is undergoing some changes. They were able to spot snowstorms at the poles uh, on Mars. Uh, this is not our usual snow. This is actually uh, carbon dioxide or dry ice type of snow. One of the last major probes that got there was called MAVEN, which is the Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Experiment uh, spacecraft. And uh, what it was supposed to do is find uh, some of the ancient history about Mars. And it did. It found that the surface of Mars is actually evaporating. It's evaporating water and hydrogen. And, as it, and the reason why it's doing that is because the atmosphere of Mars is being pelted by the solar wind. We've been able to, uh, scientists have been able to actually uh, find some of that uh, material by actually landing on the planet.
and there have been There have been eight probes that have landed on the planet. Nine probes that have landed on the planet. So we have Mars 3 over here, which no longer works. But then we have Vikings 1 and 2. We have uh, Sojourney, uh, the little tiny uh, shoebox arrangement. We have Spirit and Opportunity, the two rovers. We have Phoenix that landed uh, toward the North Pole of Mars. We have Curiosity that is uh, still running around on the surface of Mars. And just uh, uh, a couple of months ago, we had InSight that landed on Mars to measure uh, Mars quakes and other things like that. Uh, Spirit and Opportunity, the two rovers on Mars, took some amazing pictures of the surface. Uh, they're able to enhance them with color. They found uh, actually riverbeds uh, that used to have water in it probably a couple of billion years ago. And they found that creek beds were still on the surface. In addition, they found dust devils that would uh, churn up the surface of, uh, of the planet and even condensation of various liquids, including water, on the surface of objects as they get cold. And again, the sublimation of dry ice as it heats up under the Martian sun. And if you watch the uh, uh, the little X on the on the uh, left, you can see that given time there is condensation that will form on that particular piece of instrumentation. Also, they've been able to track. Uh, globe-wide dust storms. And that would actually form and cover the planet in about a week. Of course, if you have dust storms, then you wouldn't be able to see the sky on Mars. And certainly watching the sky on Mars, you would find some familiar objects. For one thing, the sun, uh, you would actually have eclipses of the two moons that encircle Mars, uh, Phobos and Deimos, and as, because they don't look as nearly as nice as the eclipses on the Earth. But you would be able to see some objects in the Martian sky. The rovers also took a look at the uh, surface of Mars, when one of the rovers had a wheel uh, malfunction, they actually had to drive it backwards while dragging the wheel, and they were able to figure out exactly how much uh, 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 torque there was on the surface by how deep the gully was made by the wheel. And again, they found uh, creek beds on Mars that were extremely similar to what was going on on the Earth. So it was a really a, a, a neat, you know, this is a neat picture. And it, it shows that at one point, Mars did have water on it. The rover's opportunity and spirit were only supposed to last 90 days. Opportunity, I, I, I believe spirit lasted about uh, five years. And uh, opportunity, I think, uh, just, just died about two years ago. So it lasted about, oh, about uh, 12, 13 years. But 
still it still kept track of its daily motion and the opportunity was uh, way out in, in the open and as, as, it, as it drove around, it got to a point where the solar panels weren't quite aligned to be able to catch the sun, to catch the energy from the sun. And that's when things started to break. The last message received from the last transmission from opportunity is kind of a tearjerker. It gave a picture of its long shadow and the transmission was, my battery is low and it's getting dark. And that's where, that's where the, the opportunity uh, basically died. sad. They did find some interesting things on the planet. Uh, for one thing, they find, find things that look like something else, like Mickey Mouse down in the lower left, or an elephant lower right. Looks like the uh, Hans Christian Andersen statue uh, on the upper right, and I'm not quite, looks like a pyramid. Uh, on the upper left there. And of course, we have things like this, which really spark the imagination. And of course, the British uh, equivalent of the Enquirer uh, definitely knew what it was. It was a statue of Elvis. So there's definitely a sense of humor there. But of course, CNN had to get into that fray as well, and they found the jazz trio on Mars uh, performing out in the middle of a desert. So I'm not quite sure what they were looking at. We do know that Mars started out its time as a planet uh, probably very close uh, or very similar to the Earth, where there were blue skies or somewhat blue skies and clouds, and there was water. Given time, it lost that ability to hold water, to hold its atmosphere, and uh, stay, even though it was in the habitable zone, it's just, just a dead planet. There might be liquid water below the surface, and they have found uh, some liquid water on the surface, but it doesn't last very long, uh, simply because uh, something happened on Mars that uh, basically destroyed it. First of all, Mars would have a tough time trying to hold any atmosphere on it, simply because the gravity is so much less than the Earth. Sunlight is so much less. And the atmosphere because of this is so much thinner. But there was, uh, but as a, but the, what, would, what happened on Mars uh, basically uh, destroyed whatever magnetic field that may have been on the planet. As a result, the solar wind actually falls to the planet all the way down to the surface. It's been estimated that Mars is losing several tons of dust per day because the solar wind is actually blowing it away. Our magnetic field covers the planet. Uh, Mars basically has remnants of a magnetic field that is no longer very effective against the solar radiation or the solar wind. The giant volcano on Mars, Olympus Mons, gives a hint as to why this may be so. We know on the Earth, uh, 
First of all, uh, volcanoes aren't nearly as tall as Olympus Mons. Second, the plate tectonics will actually carry a new land mass over an existing magma pool. As a result, it'll form a ring of volcanoes. Mars doesn't have plate tectonics. As a result, the same volcano will build on itself from the magma pool that is under it. So we have Olympus Mons that is absolutely huge and is actually visible uh, you know, on the surface of the planet. There must be a reason why this happened. There must be a reason why uh, Mars doesn't have a magnetic field, doesn't have plate tectonics. And actually, the evidence is on the planet itself. You can see that on the right object, there is that looks like a blue pool that is actually a very low area. On the other side, in the middle of the planet, you can see that there is a very high area right next to a very long crack. And that might be a scar from a prehistoric hit from an asteroid. At some point, Mars may have been hit by an asteroid about the size of the moon, which actually cut into the planet, actually destroying uh, part of its core and uh, disrupting the heat cycle that were to form plate tectonics. So whatever was inside that planet was tremendously disrupted by this asteroid or meteor that hit it. And as a result, the crack on the other side was bulging in, uh, in temperature and in uh, and the, uh, the heat from its, uh, uh, from its hit. Right now, on the way, there is a rocket. This is Mars 2020, and it's carrying on the next rover is called Perseverance. It was launched on July 30th. And right now, it is on its way to Mars. And it should get there right around in the right around the beginning of February. What will happen is as it's going, as you can see, the spacecraft will actually follow Mars and the Earth. It'll actually catch up to Mars where the gravity of Mars will catch it and it'll have a chance to land on the planet. And as you can see, it'll get there right around the beginning of February. And land on the planet. But of course, and so Mars 2020 will land on Mars. It'll have the rover and it'll have something new. It'll actually have a little helicopter that will take pictures of the surface and uh, really kind of neat. The new landing techniques as the Mars rover is coming down, it'll take photos of the area and then will divert if necessary so that it won't fall over. Probably a good idea. Once it's on the surface, it'll set up experiments, it'll have a primary mission, and then 
it'll be able to extend itself uh, actually a couple of miles away to be able to have an extended mission to be able to find water on the planet. Then it'll have a helicopter. And this helicopter will be able to take off on the, from the surface of Mars and be able to fly uh, using photographs taken by the orbiters so that it knows where it is, theoretically. But of course, Mars 2020 was not the first educational tool that landed on Mars. That was actually Mrs. Fizzle and uh, her magic school bus. In the process of getting lost in the solar system, uh, well, they landed on Mars, and as you can see, uh, they set up a little telescope. Uh, they had experiments, and uh, Mrs. Fizzle was able to teach them about this planet. One thing I really have trouble with with Mrs. Fizzle is the technology she used in order to get there. Um, it takes about, well, it takes about eight months to get to Mars. How did she do it in a couple of days? I mean, there is there's something to that. And so I started investigating how we actually get there. And the way we get there is by using the the orbit of the Earth and the orbit of Mars, and we actually have to catch up to Mars. And that only happens when Mars and Earth are at their closest. Um, so we can set that up. So we have the sun in the middle, we have Mars further away, we have the Earth. And when we get going, you can see that Earth will actually go around a little bit more than twice the speed of Mars. So there's only certain times that we can actually get to Mars, or else the distance is just, just too much. So let's get that started. And as you can see, the Earth is pulling away from Mars. And as it does that, you can see they're coming together. And there's one place. Then we have to wait another two years. And finally, Earth will catch up again. And there's the next time. And one more time, uh, two years later. And there's the third time. So we can only get to Mars during those times when Mars is at its closest. So what's happening here is the fact that we have put the spacecraft into a high orbit, so into a high, or so that it'll catch up to Mars, where Mars will catch it, and then the probe will able, actually be able to land on Mars. What about people? Will people be able to go to Mars and actually land on the surface? Well, yeah, but there's an awful lot of stuff that has to happen before we can do that. You know, uh, maybe Mars isn't that dangerous, but getting there especially being isolated for nine months. You see what happens when people are isolated just for two months or three months. Um, not a pretty picture. Uh, so if we were to get to Mars, some of the hazards we have to watch out for, 
Number one is space radiation. Every astronaut that went to the moon has developed advanced cardio diseases. And they're not sure why. They think the radiation of being beyond our Van Allen belts may have done that, but they're not sure. Hazard number two is isolation and confinement. Three is distance from the earth, how long it would take a, a pizza to get to you. Would it still be warm? Uh, the next one would be gravity. What happens when you're in a gravity field that doesn't have much gravity to it? And finally, hazard number five is living in a hostile or a closed environment, which brings all sorts of political questions, but I don't think I'll get in that. So first of all, space radiation. Space radiation is deadly. You will at least develop some type of a heart disease. Most likely it'll develop cancer. Uh, eventually it will kill you. So space radiation has to be dealt with and it has to be dealt with seriously. And our lessons we learned from Chernobyl have actually helped. Not so much the bad stuff, because there's plenty of bad stuff there. Uh, for instance, this is a picture that was taken of the site virtually the next day. And you see the fogging on the bottom of the picture where the, then in that particular case, that's where the film was actually closer to the earth at the bottom of the camera. The radiation actually fogged the film. Using color film, it has all sorts of, uh, well, they'll say background noise. So that was actually uh, this, these pictures were actually destroyed by the radiation just by the fact that they were there. Next, the radiation has affected all sorts of life in that area. Uh, mutated deer, you know, just a, a horrible thing. Uh, we have the catfish that doesn't stop growing. Just <laughs> I'm not sure I would fry it up and eat it, tell you the truth. Uh, then we have plants that were mutated and did some very strange things. Some entrepreneurs in Russia did manage to harvest some grains and they made a drink out of it. They did make sure that it was safe. They actually sent a lot of the uh, grain uh, to the University of Portsmouth in England for uh, analyzing and they found that it was safe and they are selling this atomic vodka. And 75% uh, of the profits are gonna go into the community of uh, Chernobyl. So we have uh, ra radioactive uh, drinks coming out of this area. Another uh, strange thing was a mold, a fungus that developed in that area that actually uh, thrived on melatonin. Now melatonin is the dye is actually a layer of skin in our bodies that will turn dark to protect us against harmful radiation. They found that this fungi will actually block radiation. And it does a pretty good job of it. Right now, as we sit here, it's being tested on the International Space Station because this might be the answer to, uh, to keeping people safe from space radiation. 
and it wouldn't weigh nearly as much as one of the other solutions, which was carrying a kind of a girdle of water around the spacecraft. So that might be something interesting. Next, we have isolation and confinement. Now, you know what happens if you are isolated and confined and to, to just the same schedule every day, you turn into Jack Nicholson. Uh, yeah, there's a perfect example of isolation and confinement syndrome. There are armies of therapists that are interviewing astronauts in order to be able to cope with this type of living. Next, we have distance from Earth. Now, there's an awful lot more to this than just ordering pizzas. Um, the machines on the bottoms are called autodocs, and they were machines, they are actually uh, fictional machines that were in the movies, uh, one of them for passengers, and the other one was for Prometheus. But if you get right down to it, if there is an emergency on the International Space Station that requires immediate help, the best you can do is about five hours in order to get them down to Earth. That would be an amazing thing. Uh, it would take at least three and a half days from the moon. And if you were coming back from Mars, aside from the fact that it, it may or may not be that two year cycle, it would take you at least either a year or three years to get back from Mars. As a result, the astronauts on the International Space Station are trained in many medical procedures. Some of the things you don't hear about. Next, we have gravity. And gravity affects people very, very uh, poorly. We were not made to live in space, just that simple. Because when we do live in space, there's a whole host of things that happen to us that will uh, eventually cause a great deal of uh, not only discomfort, but given enough time, will kill us. Uh, for one thing, if we list them all, uh, the vision may be worse because pressure changes in the, in the brain, your body would actually uh, uh, hold fluids in your legs. As a result, your heart would actually beat harder, it would pump harder. Uh, your muscles would shrink because of lack of use. And without exercise, you would lose uh, about 10% 10, 10 of your bone mass. And, to, you know, uh, and then you would probably be uh, sleep deprived because you would be, well, outside of waiting for your pizza, uh, you'd only get about six hours of sleep. Next we have, so one of the ways of getting around this uh, was actually demonstrated in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, where they actually had a part of the spacecraft that would re that would rotate, causing some well, artificial gravity. Now you can't do that on the space station, but you can exercise. And the astronauts are required to exercise at least two hours a day. And that will keep their muscle tone. Next we have hostile or closed environments. And I cannot think of a more closed environment than the International Space Station. Look at that. How he can go through that and not get hung up on something is actually is mind boggling. That is a closed environment. I mean, you know, the, 
you know, I think enough said. Anyway, um, uh, but if they've lived on hostile environments on the moon. And as you can see, just being able to walk around on the moon is a, is a bit of a problem. They just fall over. And this guy on the lower left realized that the door slammed and he didn't have his key. Oh well. So what is the future of Mars? I believe that in a hundred, maybe 150 years, there will be a Martian colony and it'll be along the lines of this, where there'll be uh, uh, laboratories and uh, hydroponics on the surface of Mars, taking advantage of the energy coming from the sun. And underground Mars, they have found uh, volcanic uh, 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 tunnels and channels under the surface where they can build protected uh, Uh, housing for the astronauts. So this is what I think the future will hold for Mars. Well, that's, uh, we're definitely a little late because of the problems we've had, but one of the things, so again, next week we have uh, the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, living high and cool and cool, in the gas streams or air streams. Sorry, I had to do that. I just um, just just decided to try that. Anyway, um, if you would, if you uh, if you enjoy these, would like to see more of them, uh, they are being recorded and probably heavily edited, and uh, they will be on YouTube.